water is a thousand times more dense than air. Welcome to the Surf Mastery Podcast. We interview the world's best surfers and the people behind them to provide you with education and inspiration to surf better. All about reducing resistive drag. All right, welcome to the Surf Mastery Podcast. Today, my guest is Rob Case. Rob is the creator of X Swim and the Surfing Paddling Academy. Rob has over 30 years experience as a competitive and recreational pool and long distance open water swimmer. Rob's obviously a surfer, water polo, triathlete, lifeguard, swim instructor, surf instructor. Rob's spent a lot of time in the water and what I really like about what Rob is doing is let me put it this way, Rob. I, I came across a couple of your videos uh, a couple of years ago where you break down uh, how good surfers paddle. And I was sort of always the guy that, you know, someone would, like a young kid, would paddle past me. And I'm paddling as hard as I could, and I couldn't figure <laughs> it out. I was like, man, what, he, he just must be fitter or stronger than me. And then I came across your videos, and a concept uh, called yawing and as soon as I realized what yawing was and started to uh, you know correct my yawing wow it just changed the way I paddle a surfboard and I just I have more energy in the water I my paddling's more efficient I'm catching more waves it's that simple so I think a lot of in the surf coaching world and the surf fitness world we don't talk about a paddling technique and paddling efficiency enough so could let's start there let's let's educate folks out there on what exactly yawing is yeah yeah thanks i i, I actually appreciate that story because uh it's pretty common with a lot of the clients that i come across where paddling really hasn't been on their mind until somebody passes them or they just get so fed up and frustrated with it that they're not catching waves or they're not getting out. Then it finally becomes something that is important to them. And I find that a little bit funny because if you look at the whole entire surf experience from from uh, suiting up and waxing your board to getting out there and, and riding waves and coming back, paddling and sitting on your board actually make up a majority of the time out there. So it's uh, it's quite important. I just think it's often overlooked. And uh, to answer your question, yawing, yawing is when you're you're kind of slithering through the water like a snake. You're going from side to side, and we all know that to get the fastest to get from point A to point B is in a straight line. So yawing is not actually going to help us uh, with speed or efficiency. Uh, and spending energy, extra energy to get to where we're going. So that's what yawing really is. And there's, it's funny you mentioned that one video because it's, that's really just one technique of the many that I teach that are kind of eye openers for people. Um, so it's, it's really been fun the last few years working with clients and piecing apart specifically what their issue is and trying to correct it and making their whole surf experience actually more fun and um, I've even had clients come back and say well I you know I thought you'd help me get paddling to be bearable but I'm actually enjoying myself when I paddle so that's that's always a nice thing to hear for sure yeah so so yawing is kind of like fish tailing like when the when the back of the board and the front of the board are moving in opposite directions sideways that's right and then well, as you're moving forward because of that you're basically slithering and actually a lot of stand-up paddle boarders experience yawing naturally because they're paddling on one side and then they have to paddle on the other side and if they don't have a big enough fin then that's exactly what they're going to be doing they're going to be yawing back and forth and slithering along their way yeah so i mean that obviously is naturally going to happen as you shift your weight and paddle from left arm to right arm so, what I mean, obviously there has to be some sort of movement in the surfboard as you shift your weight from left to right as you're paddling. So, what should we do? Yeah. So, you're always going to have a little bit of yaw, but we want to try and minimize it because if you try and picture you and your board moving through the water, um, 
and you're trying to move efficiently in straight line, if you're moving outside of this kind of border on your shoulders, like imagine your two shoulders are two barriers, and you're moving outside of that, you're swinging your body outside those lines. So if we can align our head, our body, and our board along one axis and actually rotate around that axis moving forward, so basically dig your rail in a little bit deeper on both sides, we're going to be rotating around that axis and we're going to prevent that yawing action from happening. Um, a lot of swimmers do this naturally because basically there's no board and so your body is the board, your body is the vessel and so we have to rotate around this this axis that goes basically from our head down to our tailbone all the way down to our feet. And as soon as we break outside of that axis, let's say we take a too wide of a stroke or too narrow of a stroke, we've now broken that axis and now we're going to start yawing and that's not going to be efficient paddling. Yeah, okay. So so there's, so instead of yawing, uh, the weight shift that happens as we paddle needs to create a slight roll instead of a slight yaw. That's right. That's right. And again, that's only one aspect of it. That's kind of the what I call lateral balance. So that's if you're looking at the way you're paddling from the front. So if you're paddling straight at me, you want your lateral profile or the width of that profile to be very thin and streamlined because what people don't realize is that water is a thousand times more dense than air. And so if you can imagine yourself biking against the wind what do we always what do you try to do when you're biking against the wind you make you try to aerodynamic real, yeah aerodynamic and small right so if if water is a thousand times more dense than air and we have to make ourselves hydrodynamic and aerodynamic for the water basically and cut through the water one way to do that is to keep that lateral profile or how wide your profile is to be very thin and that rotation keeps you from going outside that lateral profile and that keeps you from yawing. So the rotation is really the only way, one, you can get your hand up out of the water without slapping it or going wide. I see a lot of surfers when they do their recovery swing their arm wide and that's one of the causes of yawing. As you swing your arm wide, what does the rest of your body do? It follows along with that motion and it kind of slides. So when you're rotating, you can actually lift your elbow up high behind you and lead with your elbow within your lateral profile. So your hand just kind of follows behind you and you stay within that lateral profile nice and streamlined. And that's just the lateral balance aspect of it. And then there's horizontal balance, of course, which is where you're positioned on the board and how you hold your head. And those are actually the first two major techniques that we we try and teach in the Surfing Paddling Academy because they're two of the most important because it's all about reducing resistive drag. And, uh, and if we can reduce resistive drag, then adding propulsion ends up being very easy. But you can't have the other way around. You can't add propulsion and lift weights and become this big, hulky paddler and say, I'm going to paddle like crazy if you're dragging 600 pounds of drag behind you, whether it's lateral or horizontal. So a lot of people will gain the biggest gains in paddling efficiency by reducing resistive drag. Okay, awesome. And for folks listening that didn't quite get that, Rob's got some really good YouTube videos, which I'll link to in the show notes, that break it down even more and and you, you get a visual for it as well. I'd highly recommend that every single surfer out there watches uh, there's three videos in my in, in particular I've got in mind where he breaks down the yawing and the high elbows and head position and you're kind of writing on the screen and you break it down so well. Um, it's such valuable information. I mean, I, I guess a lot of surfers naturally just, just do it, but I think most of us out there, we kind of need to understand these concepts and, and practice them. Yeah, it's, it's funny how everyone talks about muscle memory. And even though muscle memory really doesn't have anything to do with your muscles, it has everything to do everything to do with your brain. And in order to kind of change that habit, the the wonderful thing about swimming and actually surfing paddling is with water, we have to develop this feeling. So our brain needs to recognize this feeling of 
how we're supposed to be doing it right. Right now, everybody has a feeling of whatever habit they developed, whether it's right or wrong. And so in order to, to change a habit, you need to do certain drills or you need to really consciously think about it. And then when you do that often enough, that short-term conscious thinking becomes unconscious. So the more and more that you do it and more re repetition, everyone says practice makes perfect, but really it should be perfect practice makes perfect. So the more you do it right, then the less you actually have to think about it. So even though I've been swimming competitively since, I'm th since I was three, I still do drills from time to time just to remind my brain of what it feels like to do the correct motion on a consistent basis. And now I, I can go out and I can paddle and I can swim and I don't have to think about the movements consciously, but when you are changing that habit, when we're, try when we're trying to become more efficient with our paddling and save energy so that we can go out and catch more waves and last longer in the lineup, then we do have to put a little bit of work into it. And that's usually the drill work that I put in place um, in the videos. I provide a few drills and and especially in the Paddling Academy online, I do a lot of drills. Um, and then people that come here to our facility here in the San Francisco Bay Area, I have live stroke analysis. So we get in an endless pool. We, sh we actually have an underwater camera that is almost live. Um, so it's about a one-second delay. But I can see right then and there when people are doing something slightly off and I can stop them and say here try this and they can immediately get that feeling so that the brain starts to make the connection between doing what's right from wrong and the feeling that is, is associated with both of those so it's it's actually I'm, I totally nerd out on the technology I, uh, I love this coaching technique whereas before I was in a pool and I'd have to walk to the end of the pool with the camera download the film then review it by then that feeling has completely lost they've lost that feeling in their body and their brain so they they can't relate it as quickly so what i've been able to accomplish in just one session here uh, which is about an hour i accomplish over four or five sessions in a pool and then for multiple clients people that come back over and over again uh, two or three sessions here is months worth of work in a pool. So it's, again, I totally nerd out about this stuff. So I, I apologize if <laughs> I sound a little bit nerdy in that sense, but it's it's really exciting for me and it's exciting for the clients to, to see that difference and feel that difference. Oh, yeah. You know, as surfers, it's such a unique opportunity to to stand up on a wave. I think that's why it's, you know, it takes so long to Im improve one's surfing because we don't, you know, like golfers have driving ranges. Uh -huh. uh, we don't really have that yet. Uh, maybe soon with the wave pools, but um, yeah, <laughs> you know, the better the better we can paddle, the more waves we're going to catch. So it's it's that simple. And what's so you see, obviously, see a lot of clients uh, one on one, and I'm guessing a lot of those are sort of uh, quite experienced surfers. And now, uh, what's the most uh, common paddling mistakes you see in in, in that type of surfer? That's a great question. I actually do a whole video series on biggest mistakes, and um, there's a there's a few that come to mind from that series. Um, whether it's experienced or beginner, the uh, some of the, the really most common ones that I even seen in pros. One is entering with your thumb down, and a lot of people are taught that from swimming, and in swimming it's fine. It's okay to, to enter with your thumb down. But in surfing, it's actually going to hurt the shoulder in the long run because you're twisting the shoulder inward and your body's flat. So if you were to just sit there and do that right now, it's kind of an awkward motion. If you're just to sit straight up and twist your thumb down and bring your elbow, it kind of, I'm doing it right now, it kind of hurts my shoulder a little bit just to do that. So in swimming, why that's okay is because in swimming you rotate your body a lot more so your body's not flat your body is actually turned you always swim on your side nobody ever swims on their on, on a flat body well surfing this is one of the major differences that i found in the research that i've done is that with surfing well we're flat we're we're mostly flat and even though we have that rotation from rail to rail we don't nearly have as much rotation as a swimmer does so if we're taking that same entry into the water with our thumb first, we're one, we're, we're causing 
that twist in our arm, which could long term, if we do that enough times, if you imagine the number of times you've paddled or a number of strokes in a lifetime, that could lead to some long term shoulder damage. Um, so entering flat is the simple fix to that. So enter flat with your fingertips first because it's the most tapered part of your body and then extend out. Um, so the thumb down is one of the most common ones I see. Um, and it's mostly just because, and I sometimes run into people in the lineup, I say, hey, were you a former swimmer or are you a swimmer? And they're like, oh, yeah. And I'm like, oh, that makes sense. Um, or they've seen it from other pros. Uh, doing it. The other reason why it's kind of worthless to enter with your thumb down is that because you end up flattening your hand for your underwater arm stroke anyway. So it's actually a, an extra movement. So why not just eliminate that movement, enter with the flat hand, and then you're ready to, and set up for that underwater arm stroke. Um, and then another really big mistake that uh, will also affect the shoulder, and, I, and, I, and I'm kind of pointing these two out because one of the goals uh, of the program is to prevent shoulder injury so we can basically surf for life, um, is during the first phase of the underwater arm stroke, which many people call the catch, um, I call it the lift phase. It's actually, there's a phase before the catch um, that is quite important. If you're on a shortboard and you're entering flat now and you're extending forward your arm before you drop your hand and forearm down to the seafloor or down to the pool, bottom of the pool, that, that moment from going flat to about 45 degrees, you don't want to apply any force. You don't actually want to enter and immediately apply force down in your stroke. That's another thing I see all the time with experienced surfers. They feel like they need to take a stroke immediately in order to move quickly through the water. And it's not, that's just not the case with a lot of the research I've done and, and a lot of the one-on-ones that I've done. Um, so what you'd rather do is just allow that hand and forearm to drop naturally. And a good way of thinking about this is if you're ever in your car and you're driving on the road and you stick your hand out, like you, when you were a kid, and you stick your hand out of the window and you kind of ride the wind with your hand up and down, up and down. When you lift it up, and you pitch it up, the air catches underneath your hand and it pushes your arm up. When you, when you kind of tilt it down, it hits the top of your hand and it pushes your whole arm and hand down that way. So that's, imagine again now that the air is not air, but it's water. So as the water approaches and as your hand enters, if you pitch your fingers down, if you pitch your hand down a little bit, your hand and arm are going to naturally go down. So you don't need to apply any force in that first phase of the underwater arm stroke or the lift phase. So don't, uh, don't, don't apply force during that. Just let it drop naturally. Because when you're pushing down, if you are pushing down, one problem is now you're using your rotator cuff muscles, which are not the ones that we want to paddle with. Those are our stabilizing muscles. We don't want to hurt those. So that's going to prevent that injury from happening. And two, if you do apply force down, simple physics, action, reaction. So if you push down, where, does you, where do you go? You go up, not forward. So it really doesn't help on two fronts by applying any force in that first phase. So extending a little bit more, letting your hand and forearm drop down to about 45, keep your elbow high. Now you can catch the water, and that's the, what I call the front propulsive phase. And that's where most of the power in your stroke actually comes from. And then there's two more phases to the underwater arm stroke. But those are, those are really the two biggest mistakes I see in experienced surfers is, is that applying force in that, front fa- in that first phase and entering with your thumb down. Okay. So not only th- does uh, working on your paddling technique increase your, your paddling speed and efficiency, but it also would save yourself from some long-term overuse, you know, what we call surfer's shoulder. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's, it's funny because I've, I haven't had any problems with shoulders, but I've run into people, especially surfers, that have shoulder problems all the time. And just those subtle adjustments sometimes take away the pain and avoid any long-term surgeries. Um, And surgeries nowadays are expensive, so 
um, and and let alone time out of the water as well. So you're trying to recover and you're trying to you're certainly trying to rehab it and uh, it it's hard. So uh, I do what I can. I'm I'm not a physical therapist by any means. Um, so I always refer out to a physical therapist and I work with one here locally. Um, and I always ask people if they've had any problems with their shoulders and we kind of just take it from there uh, to see if we can remedy the situation okay i guess that if you were to start paddling hard as soon as that hand enters the water like you said you you propel your your body up which mm-hmm. is essentially is going to drop the back half of the board down and create even more resistance there you go it's spoken like a true mess of paddling there <laughs> that's exactly it so and then if you're adding your more resistance in the back then you're you're making even worse case for yourself so there are, there are times where the lift phase is completely skipped altogether and those are with long boards or prone paddle boards so you wouldn't extend your hand because it would just be causing more drag and no propulsion. But on a shortboard, the reason we extend our hand out is because we are in the water. We are sunk in the water. And there's this fundamental concept of boat building, actually. It came from a hydrodynamicist named William Frude that realized that longer boats move faster. But the key here was longer boats at the waterline. So the length at the waterline, if it's longer, then it moves faster and more efficiently. So if you imagine you on a shortboard, let's say a low volume shortboard, where's the waterline? The waterline is your body because you're underwater. You're practically underwater. You have a little bit of the board out of the water, but the waterline itself is you. Whereas on a longboard, where's the waterline? The waterline is the whole rail of the board, depending on how long your longboard is. So if you're trying to extend your hand in that lift phase on a longboard, all you're doing is adding drag without any benefit. You're not lengthening the vessel. You're not making it longer and more efficient. You're actually just adding drag. But on a shortboard, that's why we have the lift phase. That's why we extend our hand out. We're actually lengthening our, our waterline and letting the water go by us and extending our board. So it's as if we're making our you know, 510 shortboard into a 61 shortboard instead. And it doesn't act exactly like a longer board because when we take a stroke, we lose that water line. Um, but the idea is to extend that vessel so that we can be more efficient and stretch out our strokes. And it also helps us take fewer strokes and save more energy. So it's pretty amazing watching it. Using the endless pool here at the uh, at our house, when someone is paddling in it and we have a certain current going, let's say it's a 130 per 100 meter pace, um, and they just leave their arm out there, they it's amazing the aha moment. They're like, wait a minute, I'm not drifting back. Well, no, you're not drifting back as long as you're streamlined, as long as you're extending that water line. Um, so that's kind of the fundamental concept there. Uh, and the difference between a longboard and a shortboard as well. So with a shortboard, you can extend that lift phase. On a longboard, you skip the lift phase altogether and you go right to that front propulsive or that catch phase. And then the other place where you would skip or at least shorten the lift phase a great deal is when we're catching a wave, when we're sprinting and we need a high stroke rate and we just need to get really fast speed going. Um, That's the other kind of scenario where you'd skip that extension of the arm okay now what about um how should we hold our feet a lot of surfers will cross their legs do you recommend that yeah i don't mind that um if you're casually paddling out the feet are just basically drag um in the water so if you're trying to conserve energy uh, really the best way to do is stay nice and relaxed. You can cross your feet. You can lift them out. They can be kind of at the top of the water a little bit because your body really is leading and breaking the frontal resistance. So the feet are kind of just dragging behind. Uh, but the idea is either you lift them out or you do like a two-beat kick, like a rhythmic kick. Um, so for every stroke, you take a kick, um, essentially. So it's two beats. It's like boom, boom, stroke, boom, boom, stroke. Um when you're sprinting, I suggest, and uh, studies have shown that kicking actually does, in fact, in, increase velocity. Um, what the studies don't show is whether the velocity comes from 
reduction in resistive drag, meaning when you're kicking, you actually bring that back half of your board and body up out of the water while you kick. Um, whether it's that resistive drag or the kicking is actually providing propulsive force. Um, so swim studies have shown it's a little bit of both, but they're still not even sure. But we don't need to know exactly what the reason is. We just need to know that it works. And so when you are sprinting, when you're catching a wave, kicking is a suggested technique um, as long as you can stay balanced elsewhere. And why don't we kick all the time? Well, I think that's pretty obvious because we wear ourselves out. Kicking does get quite exhausting. So if you're kicking for five, six seconds when you're catching a wave, that's not going to break the bank in terms of depleting your energy for the whole session. Yeah. What's the uh, the burn... Um, you have to uh, correct my pronunciation. The Bernoulli principle. Uh, Bernoulli. So uh, Bernoulli principle basically is that lift that I'm talking about. And... It's a principle where it comes from an airplane wing, actually. And recent studies have shown that swimming doesn't use the Bernoulli principle as much as everyone originally thought when Doc Councilman started doing the research back in the 50s. Um, and McGlisco started to continue to use it into the 80s and 90s. Um, but short answer Bernoulli is it's that lift so when I was talking about your hand being outside the window and you lifting or pitching your hand up and down while you're driving that's Bernoulli's principle the air hits the bottom it lifts up the air hits the top it pushes it down and so the way we use Bernoulli's principle or some aspect of it is in that lift phase where we're extending it and because we're extending it and water starting to hit a little bit on the bottom of the hand and a little bit on the top, if we kept our hand completely uh, flat, no pitch in the hand or the wrist at all, then we would actually provide a little bit of lift just in that one, one or two split second. Uh, but like I said before, is once you kind of get that little lift, then you want to pitch your hand down so that you can get into that front propulsive phase so you can take a stroke and add propulsion. Um, so Bernoulli, if you can, uh, you can kind of get a sense for what it feels like. One, by sticking your hand out the window. And two, another dr kind of a fun drill to do is when you're out there waiting for waves, lay down on your stomach, put your hands over your head, and just skull in and out. So skulling is when you're kind of keeping your hands flat and you're bringing them in and you're taking them out and you're pushing the water in and out over your head. And what's interesting about this drill is that you end up moving forward. And people are like, well, wait a minute. You, you always talk about action-reaction. You're pushing back so that you can move forward, right, in, in our arm stroke. With the, Bernoulli, with the Bernoulli principle or this lifting and the scrolling, you're actually pushing to the side and you're still moving forward. And so that's, that's a little bit of why that happens, a little bit of the Bernoulli principle, but recent studies have shown that it's not 100% due to that principle. So um, it, it's, it's an ongoing process even in the swim world. Yeah, okay. You've got a lot of a lot of free videos for folks to check out, which is awesome. Um, you've even got some stuff you kind of breaking down some duck diving stuff as well. Um, so much information, so much free information you've got uh, on your on your blog, on your website, on your YouTube channel. So I highly recommend every surfer goes and, and checks that out. And like you mentioned, you're also working one on one with people. Where, so where exactly are you doing that? We are we're located about 20 minutes north of San Francisco, California. So uh, people in the Bay Area here will come up uh, for a session or two, and we usually space them out within about, about a month. So every four weeks, have someone come back. That way, it gives them plenty of time to work on kind of the assignments that I give them, the things that I that we worked on, and then we can move on to kind of the next thing. Um, and I've had a few clients fly in from. I have one flying in from London next month. I have a couple flying in from Brazil and a, a few from Australia actually. Um, while they're in the Bay area they decided to book a session and come up here and check it out so um, it's been really beneficial for on my side to to work one-on-one -on -one. i love work, working one-on-one -on -one and seeing the change happen uh, and then the people that can't make it here 
and take the online course or they watch the YouTube videos or go through the training at surfingpaddling.com, I get a lot of feedback from them and it's it's been great. It's been a lot of fun um, and quite a passion project of mine. Yeah. Yeah, for those uh, surfers that aren't lucky enough to, to surf every day but have access to a swimming pool, you've got some awesome uh, online programs to keep them surf fit as well. Yeah, yeah. So I kind of break down my overall goal is trying to help people catch more waves because if we can all catch more waves, we're all going to have a lot more fun in the lineup. And and really the first part of that is technique. Uh, technique is... You, you, if you can be as fit as a fiddle, but if your technique's bad, as we talked about earlier, you could either get injured or you would burn energy where you don't need to burn energy. Um, so if you can get the technique down first, then at the fitness level, you can make those same movements with even less effort and catch even more waves. And then really the third kind of aspect of it is uh, position and timing. You know, you need to be be able to time your drop and position yourself uh, in the right place on the wave. So if you combine those three together, um, you can catch a lot of waves. And that's really kind of where my mindset is, is uh, I've listened to a lot of some of your uh, podcasts and and some other areas where most of the pro surfers say, hey, listen, the only difference between you and me is that I've caught more waves than you. And it's true. You know, it's practice. It's that repetition. And so uh, if you get the technique down, which is the Surfing Paddling Academy, my X-Swim for Surfers program is the fitness aspect of it where we, we keep you in the water, you know, because a lot of fitness programs are land-based and um, you lose that feeling of the water that I talked about. And that feeling is very important for your brain to make that connection. Um, but it also, if you, I'm a, I'm a swimmer and I hate swimming. <laughs> you know, I, I, I really started to enjoy swimming only when I started surfing and playing water polo because now I had a purpose for swimming. So my the X-Swim workouts, there's swimming aspect to it, but there's also a lot of dry land uh, and what I call transitional movements, which are the types of movements that we use when we are we're actually riding a wave. So a lot of leg work, a lot of balance work, a lot of flexibility work, uh, and agility training. So it, it's Surf Paddling Academy, X Swim for the fitness, or really any fitness program that um, that that you fancy. Um, just as long as you're getting fit and you're making those movements easier. And then the last kind of phase is the positioning and timing. And I'm in the process of building that class right now, actually. So what do you mean by positioning and timing? You mean catching the wave? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, you can have the greatest technique and you can be fit, but if you're not in the right spot on the wave or the most optimal spot on the wave, you're not going to catch it. So uh, one of the things that a lot of my clients have asked about is um, when I'm when I'm surfing a steep wave, for example, how should I drop in versus kind of a flatter or what I call like a burgery wave, what we call a burger, mush burger. Um, so there's different places you can be on those waves and there's different ways that you can drop in on those. And I, I got kind of the idea from um, a friend of mine who used to surf professionally and and I could paddle circles around the guy, uh, both because I was more fit but and also because of the technique. But he would take two paddles and catch a wave. And I, <laughs> and I was always amazed by that. Um, it, it was because he just knew where to be and knew where to catch the wave. And, um, and so I've been researching a lot of different pros techniques, where they line up, where they, um, where they set up, how they time their paddles. And I've been another kind of aha moment was something that Slater said down at Bell's um, a couple of years back. He was saying that if you look at the wall of Bell's beach uh, or a Bell's wave, it's you have to take a mid-face bottom turn. If you go all the way down, you lose all the speed. And if you look at it from the side, he's like, that's kind of where I got that idea. If you look at the wave from the side or the transition from top to bottom, every wave has a different transition. Um, Whereas with skateboarding, like a skateboarding ramp, the transition's always the same. Well, with surfing, that's what makes surfing so awesome is that we always have to deal with all these different types of transitions. And so that's another kind of part of it is when you look at a wave, how do you study a wave? How do you determine what sort of transition you're dealing with and when I should pop up versus 
um, really having no idea and just going out there blind. Yeah. I guess it's like anything else, you know, if you really want to master something, you have to really start looking at the details. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you're in the midst of it now, but I imagine you're, you're kind of looking at, you know, which arm that uh, is the last stroke before the pop-up? Is that Yeah, the- a little, actually a little bit of that. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's the timing of it really has to do with the speed of the wave, too, and how fast it moves. When you look at, um, you know, what, a decade or decade and a half ago they weren't they weren't paddling into jaws they weren't paddling into piahi because they thought it was moving too fast and so a part of that innovation has been the boards uh, but also where they're positioning themselves at that break so they've kind of a lot of the pros have broken down those walls at places like chopu and in the early days even pipe you know when there were um, the long borders and they finally got the thruster and they were able to kind of cut down the face of the wave a little bit more and grab the rail so a lot of it has to do with the design but also it has to do with how they're positioning themselves Um, when they're paddling, how long they paddle for, um, and how fast they're going with the wave. I think a big misconception that I, that I hear a lot is, um, you know, I keep missing a wave because I'm not paddling fast enough and I'm looking at them going, well, you know, you paddling just helps you catch the wave. It doesn't catch the wave. Gravity is what catches the wave. Um, so you dropping out of the sky, whether it's a steep wave or a, a very bushy wave, it's really what gravity is what does it. Because, and I came I came to this realization because if you look at the speed at which prone paddleboarders paddle versus how fast waves move, so prone paddleboarders in the Molokai to Oahu uh, paddleboard race, they average about eight miles an hour on the in the unlimited uh, category. That is very fast. I go out here on my lagoon, and I average about five miles per hour on my prone in flat water, and that, I think I'm like sprinting. So how do they move so quickly in that race? How do they move eight to ten miles an hour in that race when the fastest swimmers in the world move four miles an hour, and if you're flat water on a prone paddleboard, you may be hitting five or six miles an hour. How are they hitting eight or ten, eight to ten? Well, they're riding the waves. They're riding the swells. So it doesn't have as much to do with paddling as many people think in terms of catching a wave. Um, it has to do with gravity. That's the majority uh, force that's happening. Paddling sets you up in a position so that you can possibly catch it earlier and set up your line the way that you want to. So if you're not paddling at all versus somebody that paddles or takes six to eight strokes, uh, a good example, me and my buddy, where I came the I came up with the idea, he takes two strokes, I take five or six. But for me, I'm not as good a surfer as him, so I need more time to set my line and really to identify what line I want to take. Where do I want to set my bottom turn? Where do I want to set my my top turn or, or pull in uh, whereas he can take two strokes and immediately find that line that he wants so there's a, there's so much of that going on in that uh, in that research that it, for me it's just exciting to put it all together and it's going to be in a similar format uh, with videos and uh, illustrations so that people can really digest it well cool I look forward to that yeah so is there anything else you want to talk about I think one of the things that I hear a lot is why are you giving away all the free free secrets of yours? <laughs> you know, why would you why would you give away your advantage in the lineup? And um, I, I try and share this with all of my clients. I say, you know, Duke was fantastic at sharing surfing with the world, and he he's quite quite the role model to me in that he was an Olympian swimmer as well and kind of the overall waterman and he believed in sharing the sport and sharing what we know about it especially within our own community so I always emphasize um, you know if if you know somebody that this can help um, whether it's through the Surfing Paddling Academy online the paid version or the free version through YouTube or through the free series pass it on you know share it don't be afraid to to share what you know and what you learn and that actually brings our surf community together uh, so as opposed to people being frustrated out in the lineup and making the whole session kind of a downer for everybody help people out make them less frustrated um, and paddling is one of the most 
frustrating thing. So if we can make it enjoyable and everyone can enjoy it, then we're all going to have a better time out in the lineup. So uh, I just urge people to go out and as you're learning new things, whether it's riding a wave or fitness or paddling or, or board design, share it with your friends, share it with other people in the lineup and, and let's progress our sport and, and our culture. Oh, I totally agree. Yeah. The better the beginner surfers are, the better the the advanced surfers are. Yeah, absolutely. And the less pissed off we'll be about yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, thank you so much for your time, Rob. I really appreciate it. And we'll just mention your website again. That's xswimfit.com. That's xswimfit.com. And uh, youtube.com forward slash xswimfit as well is the YouTube channel. And like I said before, I'll put uh, uh, links to to all of that stuff in the show notes. And as well as um, uh, surfingpaddling.com. Okay. That one's a real simple one. Yep. Cool. Awesome. I really appreciate your time. Thanks, Rob. And look forward to uh, to looking at your thoughts on breaking down the, the paddling in. Yeah, absolutely. It'll be a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for tuning in to the Surf Mastery Podcast. Again, I'm your host, Michael Frampton. Make sure you subscribe so you can keep up to date with the latest interviews. Please share with your friends. Check us out uh, on Facebook at uh, Surf Mastery Surf. And if you're on iTunes, please go and give us a little rating. That'd be awesome. Until next time, keep surfing.